You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 107, The Dental Guys Book Club, part four, Zero Bone Loss Concepts by Tomas Linkovicus. This week, we continue by reviewing chapters nine and chapters 10 and complete the surgical portion of Zero Bone Loss Concepts. We discussed, does horizontal connective tissue around your implants really matter? What dimensions should you consider? And what about your implant choice? Tomas makes some recommendations in chapter 10 that you're going to want to hear. We even discuss a little bit about third wave coffee this week on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. Well, hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And uh, for us, it's uh, it's the first episode of 2020 that we're recording, so we're going to be released here in a little bit. But, uh, you know, it gets a little crazy around Christmas, and uh, we, we've we been kind of preparing for what we're com- what's coming up, but it's, it's good to finally get to sit down and record after kind of like we're trying to recover from being out for a little while from the office and then you know you come back and like vacation coma that's uh, and that huge stack of like bills and mail gets like boom dump dump down on the desk you know mm-hmm. and it's just demoralizing and you're like ah oh, i gotta like <laughs> dig out of this and you know of course if you've been doing any kind of like tax planning you know you're trying to typically delay uh you know income into 2020 or the next year and you're trying to buy a bunch of crap a lot of times to Mm -hmm. you know make maximize expenses in that year so you know then you get all these bills you're like great just bought a bunch of stuff bought like my first two months worth of supplies and now all these bills come in i'm like so anyway it just is what it is man it's part of it and then you're trying to like dig i had like four emergency calls over the break, including a marathon runner. <clears throat> Say this is reminiscent of my story I told about when I fell running in Dallas. Oh, no. A marathon runner patient, he was 20 miles in and tripped and fell and, and fractured number nine and 10. 10 was mm. mobile, nine is a horizontal root fracture, about two thirds of the way down the route, we're hoping is savable. But anyway, he, you know, I get a call. Yeah, he fell and fractured his teeth, and you know, it's ugh. So anyway, it's just been the way it is. But thankfully, things like a good cup of coffee mm. bring it back, right? You know, and we haven't really talked about this on the show very much. But both of us are well. We talked about it a little bit back with Darren Deister back in the day, right? right. We had like a little brief conversation geeking out that was a live that's right video that was right it was out at spear and but both of us are sort of into the whole coffee thing the and the third craft coffee the third wave coffee that's the new way of saying wes explain (laughs) third wave coffee to our listeners because it's so easy i I just want to first of all say there's a thing if you guys have watched there's a show out there i'm just gonna say i don't usually use these words a whole lot on the show but it's called the douchebag jar and let me just define the douchebag jar, okay, for those of you guys who don't know what that means. It's basically the idea is that if you say something that makes you sound like a snob, okay, right. then you're supposed to put a dollar in the show. This comes from the show New Girl, my, which my wife loves. She loves Zoe Deschanel. Anyway, and th- it's a running gag. Essentially, it's one of the guys is always saying something that makes him just look like a total snob, and he has to put... So anyway, everything we're about to say we realize is like put a dollar in the douchebag jar. So we just, we accept that. We are those people. You guys probably already know that. So Wes, what is third wave coffee? Well, third wave coffee is, is really just a term surrounding people that enjoy high 
quality coffee. And if you've ever listened to this show you and you've missed it, I mean, I drink coffee on this show sometimes. And so does John. I think, hey, John, oh, you have a cup yeah. of Got something a cup of right some there right now. methodical right here, yeah. And, and I just had a cup. Mm-hmm. I just had a cup of um, a cup of coffee that was amazing, and that's how this coffee conversation started. Was John made a trip to one of his kind of premier roasters of 2019 that he kind of just lucked into finding? Yep. Methodical Coffee. Yep. Greenville, South right? Carolina. Greenville, South Carolina. You got to check them out online. Yep. They've got some good. They've got some good. Uh, roast going on down there and one of the things that third wave coffee brings about is you're in you're really intense about finding high quality coffee and i and i've really tried to find it locally luckily i live in a town where i have several third wave coffee shops which basically means they roast and they brew coffee in the same place and, so and you third can go wave there. i mean is is essentially saying that this is it's kind of looking at coffee like i would say looking like, yeah, like wine. wine like wine it's very similar yeah it's like you know where it was grown you kind of understand mm-hmm. how like the soil the weather affects the beans and how the different roasts affect the flavor and mm-hmm. and, and you know you, you you choose the beans that are freshly ground and freshly roasted within a certain amount of time you measure out the water you measure out the co- everything is calculated yeah. everything to to enjoy coffee to let's, basically the highest level right let's talk about a a particular website that John just turned me on to called the compass dot coffee compass, the coffee compass.com and the new year's resolutions that they put up for five coffee resolutions for 2020. And I like them. Yeah, I like them. If you want to check it out, the coffee compass.com uh, I'm just going to hit a few of them here, right here. And one that I really like because I try to do these things is stop, under extracting coffee. I love this. I now, love this. here's the <laughs> this thing. This is where you you have to put a dollar in the douche bag jar for saying that. V- Let's seriously, say, right? Stop under extracting. So, <laughs> the only way to do this is if you have a grinder, yep, right? Yep. And so let's say you're down to the bottom of the bag, right? I don't want to waste any beans because I want to be, well, actually, actually one of these resolutions. Yeah. Is don't waste any beans. So say I end up with 20 grams left. Yeah, I weigh my coffee. Okay. I'm going to actually make my grind a little finer with that 20 grams so that I can over extract, right? I've got more water in contact with the grind, with the coffee bean, okay, powder, okay? Love it. And one of the things that that is kind of becoming more, you know, kosher to find in one of these third wave shops to make sure that you're extracting the coffee is a refractometer. Okay, now I don't have refractometer. Man. Right, because you're measuring the amount of coffee in the water dissolved solute dissolved in solution. <laughs> <laughs> and so what we're looking oh, for, right? Man. Is around 20%, okay? <clears throat> and so it's a $300 machine here. A little, you know, it's a chemistry set, yeah, you know, yeah. to do this. So pretty cool stuff. Check out the coffee Um, you know, um, wait, when you start getting said, into this world, it's it's like a slippery slope because the first yeah, I don't want to go the first thing you need to do, because let's for our listeners, okay. I know you're probably going, Oh man, these people. But you if you've listened to our show long enough, you knew that something like this was coming. I mean, Wes, you know, and I always talk about stuff like this. Mm-hmm. But if you want your like here's here's what you should do. Because Starbucks is not third wave coffee, really. Not no. not the typical Starbucks. I mean, it's not bad. We're not saying it's bad, but we're saying you know that was where people started maybe first getting turned on to making like a consistently more quality, focusing more on the quality of the coffee versus just gas station whatever's right. there. But what you should do if you haven't is seek out a, a a shop that does this. Now, some I would say probably I think you'd agree with me, Wes, that if you your average person, if you're near any type of big city. You should go check out a right. blue bottle coffee, right? Go check out a blue bottle yeah. coffee shop for a good example of of a 
a, a very consistent, high quality third wave coffee shop. And the reason we say blue bottles, cause there's a ton of them. Now we'd prefer you find a local place that's your, you know, is nearby to you. So you support your local mm-hmm. economy. But if you go to like New York or you go to San Francisco or you go to, you know, some place that's got, you know, some, some civilization, uh, that you're going to find blue bottle and you can experience what we mean you t- ask the barista about the coffee, ask them about the beans, ask them where they came from. And they're going to know things just like if you went to Napa and ask about the wine that you're tasting, they're going to know the history. They're going to know the weather in the area where those grapes were Mm -hmm. raised. And if you start learning how that affects it and you leave yourself open to the idea that you can experience these different tastes and smells and aromas and things, it can be very cool because it doesn't take a lot of gear or a lot of knowledge to make a really great cup of third wave coffee in your home. And, uh, and it really changes the game of your day uh, spending a few extra minutes because it takes a few extra minutes. Yeah, I mean, I spent five minutes just making a single cup of coffee just a minute ago. Yeah. But, I, but I actually really enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed making it, but then I also enjoyed drinking it because I actually, when I, I was tasting it, and as I was tasting, I was like, do I get some notes of like lemon and... Mm like some lime in there. And I was like, it's kind of finishing with a more lime and I go over and get the bag and that's what they had written on the bag. Yeah. And so you've been around and that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about is that this is kind of a specialty type of a thing, but I really feel like that it's not going away. No, no. Um, it's something that is, you're going to see more and more of these, off the beaten path roasters. You're going to see companies that you thought you'd never heard of come to the front like methodical. Um, you know, we used to say that blue bottle was the echelon of all like third wave mm. places. And then they've recently been bought out in the last couple of years by Nestle. So we're not saying it's a bad thing that Nestle bought them. I'm concerned about that. Right. But, um, but that Just tells like you a all, lot about how this is getting bigger is that it's even big. big companies are seeing this kind of like micro brews, kind of like, again, yep. winemakers, the they're looking thing. at this and going, okay, craft brewing, craft coffee, it's very similar, and it's very cool. Think, it's very cool. It's very cool. It's cool to be able to go down the road from my office and visit a guy that's doing it right, mm-hmm. that is investing in high-quality roasting equipment and... And he kind of brings me back and, you know, shows me what he's doing. That's fun, right? Because he's developing taste by the roast. And then I'm helping to extract some of those things at home of what he's trying to intend the end drinker to get. So, I mean, that's cool. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So, anyway, so now we're going to just leave you with that. (laughs) Go check it out. You should go, you know, learn more about it. If it's something that, if you like coffee, if, if you already like coffee, you should definitely take that up a notch and find a great craft coffee place, or or maybe even try it in your in your house. And you know, this episode is is a continuation of what we've been doing, going through mm-hmm. uh, zero bone loss concepts by Tomas Lincovicius. And one thing that's been really cool is to see uh, him kind of reposting what we're talking about. We appreciate that, and we really appreciate that because. I, I think it, it kind of validates that, first of all, we're, we're, we're kind of getting across what he intended, uh, and, and mm-hmm. it's giving people a, a, another way to connect with what he has written and, and hopefully what's changing your practice. And today, we're going to get into more of, of these surgical concepts uh, or essentially mm-hmm. things dealing with more of the surgical or biologic side uh, of what creates an environment that is conducive to zero bone loss. You know, last time where we left off was with vertical soft tissue thickness, which is such a huge part of, of really what brought a lot of his book into being or his, his research was really focused on this. But this next chapter, chapter nine, it's a little bit more challenging, I think, because the vertical soft tissue thing makes sense because we understand biologic width, so I think it's just another step in our minds forward. Uh, it, it's a game changer, but it kind of makes sense innately. But when you start mm-hmm. talking about this next chapter, which is attached tissues around implants, I think at first glance, everybody's like, oh yeah, well, of course you need attached implant, attached tissues around implants. But is that really true? What is attached tissue? What's that? What does that mean? Um, mm-hmm. So we're gonna get into that, and we're gonna talk about what is important 
about that. So Wes, why don't you, I kind of let you take the lead on that. Cause I know you've been, you've been kind of focusing on this chapter. Yeah. So after we get back from a word from our sponsor, that's right. Uh, we're going to get right into chapter nine. We're going to finish out the surgical portion and we'll see you back right after this word from our sponsor. Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbread here with FinanciallySimple.com. So at this point, we're working on increasing the value of our company and we're focusing on planning. So many dentists are efficient in managing your calendars for work. However, managing the planning schedule is often lacking. Here is the planning schedule that our top dental clients utilize. At the beginning of the year, we outline the top three objectives your practice must accomplish during the course of the year. Now, like we talked about in the last episode, you would condense your objectives down to four 90-day blocks. Then you break the action steps down to monthly pieces, then to weekly, and finally to daily. Ever heard the old adage, how do you eat an elephant? Yeah, well it's done one bite at a time. Focus on making small, accomplishable, daily and weekly action steps that drive your practice towards your yearly goal. If you've never dealt with strategic planning, then you need to take a look at our course on FinanciallySimple.com. If you have any questions about how to drive the value of your practice up or how to potentially double your net worth every three to five years, hey, reach out to us as well through FinanciallySimple.com and we'll be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to FinanciallySimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. All right, chapter nine, we're going to finish out the surgical portion of this book, the first half of this book, chapters one through 10. Um, if you've been listening, we just finished up chapter eight, as John was saying, vertical, to- vertical soft tissue thickness. Now we're going to talk about attached tissues around dental implants. Now, John, you and I had a conversation probably about three or four years ago on a plane about how I was kind of becoming anal about some of the things I was seeing with the, with in regards to mobile tissue, mm-hmm. okay, around dental my dental implants, especially since I had moved to a more um, crown and bridge, let's say, style dental implant restoration, and we're talking about good emergence profile, matching the the contours of the adjacent teeth, um, and whenever you take out teeth, you're going to lose the buckle plate to some extent because of the muscles uh, that are pushing in on those things. And what happens is, is that naturally you see the mucogingival junction migrate up the, up the ridge or across the ridge or closer to the center line of where the tooth was positioned. Mm. And so that means you, you, narrow the amount of attached tissue. And I and I mentioned to John, I said, John, you know, sometimes when you see the rolled mobile tissue, like you can take the periodontal probe and lay it horizontally across the free gingiva and move it up and down. I said, you know how sometimes you see that um, against your restoration, I said, that kind of concerns me mm. a little bit. And I said, one of the things that I'm really trying to look at is, can I maximize mm-hmm. the amount of attached tissue to the buckle? And that was just the conversation mm-hmm. we had on the plane. And I was describing uh, some of the things I was doing at uncovering to maximize, like apically repositioning flaps mm-hmm. using uh, what I call maybe a jelly roll technique where I'm moving connective tissue from the palatal aspect or the length aspect mm-hmm. and cheating that to the buckle, repositioning that on my healing abutment so that I have a dense, bound down, fibrous tissue around the dental implant restoration. Because to be honest with you, implants are not protective. And one of the things that Tomas says right here at the beginning of chapter nine is he says, when an implant is placed and restored, soft tissues should ideally adhere to the prosthetic components and prevent the inflow of bacteria and plaque into the peri-implant sulcus, protecting the integrated implant. Mm -hmm. Now we know that that's very difficult to achieve. Some people are trying to achieve adherence, but what we know is that 
a dense, bound down, non-mobile tissue. And let's define that. Yeah. That's what we're hearing being called. What, John? Yeah, functional, functional connective tissue. Functional tissue. Yeah, and, and that's, and one that's thing. something that's really <clears throat> you know challenged us. I think that's why this chapter is more challenging because I think he, he's saying, again, is you don't necessarily know if one millimeter of attached tissue is not enough in some situations, it might be enough. You know, he's going to talk about later in the book that even the restorative material may matter. In other words, mm -hmm. if you have certain restorative materials that are maybe more porous, more attract more plaque, that maybe right. the uh, you need uh, uh, more attached tissue potentially. Or if you have, say, a material that's very smooth, doesn't attract plaque, maybe it's not as big of a deal if you have less attached tissue. But for the sake of discussion here, let's talk about this, Wes. Like, we, we went out to Pat Allen's course. Yeah, does, yeah just go right. I, you, and, you read my mind. Yeah, and, and this is mind. where, like, so I had read this book uh, probably a month before we went out to Allen's course on connective tissue grafting. And really, this book and Link of Vicious kind of inspired us initially to go, okay, we need to go learn about soft tissue grafting because we understand the importance of this soft tissue thickness. And Allen's whole thing was, you know, he's like, I, I want to make sure that, like, everybody knows that... Um, we understand what um, attached tissue is very differently than maybe what we used to. The idea I mean, used to be that it was keratinized tissue that was what we were mm -hmm. looking at. So we would say we need this amount, quote unquote, keratinized tissue. And what he, what histology has shown is that when you do connective tissue grafting or uh, allograft, you know, with alloderm, you do the histology and you find that even if the tissue on the surface doesn't the surface is not keratinized on the histology this tissue is attached to bone it's still attached tissue but even so so the words become kind of difficult because if you say attached it, how, how you can't eyeball that necessarily was well, let me just say this is he said that keratinized tissue is not even in our textbooks yeah as far as from a periodontist standpoint and here we here i have sitting beside me it was great john because we didn't sit beside each other yep. yes we sit on the front row of course if you know the dental guys we <laughs> always sit always. on the front row you'll find us there if you look for us at meetings we'll be on the front row but John sat beside a periodontist, practiced in, what, 25 yeah, years, yeah. Your, your guy? The guy beside me who had been practicing 40 years. As he's talking, Pat Allen's talking, both of the periodontists that are sitting beside us are shaking their head. Yeah, keratinized tissue really is not what it's about. Mm -hmm. It's about thick, fibrous, bound down tissue. Right. Now, does the keratin matter? Does it matter? According to Pat Allen, it doesn't. Right. He's saying that, that it's not about the, the, the way that it looks. It's about what is it actually doing histologically. And so when you read this chapter about this two millimeters of attached tissue, we need to make sure that we're careful to not just define that as keratinized tissue. Uh, right. Because you, if you've done grafting, if you've augmented that, it's much more important that the tissue is functional uh, tissue. It's functionally attached tissue. So I think as we're talking about this, that's why when we start reading through this chapter and Linkovicia starts talking about how to increase the amount of attached tissue around implants, he talks about several ways to do that, some of which Wes already kind of mm -hmm. mentioned, you know, apically repositioning flaps. Uh, he talks about uh, doing augmentation. And we don't need yeah, to dive gingival grafting. Yeah, and we don't mm -hmm. need to necessarily dive into the high weeds on this because we there's everybody kind of knows, I think, what most of the ways are to increase uh, the amount of attached tissue around things. But I think mm -hmm. that the other thing I want to focus on a little bit, Wes, is you know, he says in this chapter at one point, he says, you know, we know that vertical soft tissue thickness is important, and we know that having attached tissue is important. So even if you have one but you don't have the other, you may still have a risk of more bone loss. And so I think that's important to focus on is that we should be making sure we have both things. Yeah, he goes on to define exactly that we one recommendation is to have at least from buccal to lingual or palatal to buccal, uh, you need to have a minimum of uh, four millimeters. Now that's if you're going to do a crest of the ridge incision. You want to split the difference. If you take our surgical principles course as a part of the restorative driven implants segment, 
they'll talk about, you know, splitting that or doing techniques to apically reposition to create a zone of attached tissue that gives us this four millimeters. And I think that that's a starting point for us to start having a discussion. And I think that's what Tomas is saying here is that there's not hard evidence right now, right? But from the evidence that we can see that having two millimeters of dense bound down tissue, I like saying it like that functional tissue. I think we're going to hear more about this in 2020 is that it's going to be protective and be one of the factors that creates zero bone loss around our dental implants. Now, here's the interesting thing, John. You can't take a traditional bite wing and see the results of this. Yes, yes. You can't even take a CT because a CT will blow right through the buckle plate. Yep. Right? Because that that there is, is – it you just can't unless you have, you know – other types of imaging or unless you lay a flap and mm -hmm. who's going to do that yep. right yep. and those types of studies are hard to come by but i think what we're saying here is and what tomas is saying it just makes sense for the protection of the implant complex mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. when i say implant complex i'm talking about i'm talking about crown abutment and implant because if there is thread exposure at the base of your sulcus on the buckle that could be enough thread exposure to create a bacterial infiltration into the rough surface implant that you have placed and create bone loss yep. that's what he's saying right we need protection protection and, and i think again as bound down tissue functional tissue right and I think that down the road in this book, again, as we get into those later chapters, we're going to talk about how that protection may, again, become more important if you're talking about materials that are more apt to attract plaque. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, you, you, it That's makes right. sense. You know, if you have more <laughs> bugs hanging around, you need to have more protection from uh, in, into that uh, very, we know, very weak connection. Uh, in the mm -hmm. epithelial layer, uh, that hemidesmosomal attachment that is not strong, we may need to have uh, you know thicker and more more attached tissue. So I think that it's the thing that's messing with us a little bit is just understanding what the definition of attached tissue is that, that you cannot look at it and tell. So make sure that as you're uh, just as much in the last chapter as we talked about augmentation for vertical reasons to get thickness. We also need to be thinking sometimes more about either augmentation or repositioning flaps in order mm -hmm. to achieve adequate attached tissue. Don't let that be the thing that uh, you know takes your implant down because you were so focused on the vertical aspect but not focused on uh, the attached tissue aspect. And this really comes back. Here, here's where it hits home the most for me, Wes. Punching when implants are oh, placed, yeah. right, versus Man. flapping. And hey, let me just say this. The sidebar conversation is that, do you ever see him talking about punching? Hmm, I don't see that. Hmm. It's interesting, the evolution that we've seen in dental implant surgery. Yes, punching has been proven to work. Sure, okay? sure. We can know work. that the success rate of dental implants, but surgically, when you start to apply the principles of good incision design, yep. this, this right here this chapter is totally against punching yep because right? think about this uh, listeners if, if you think about okay you're looking at and i know not all of your implant placers it doesn't matter if you're the yeah, restorative doctor here you need to understand what your surgeon is doing because you need to understand mm -hmm. what your restoration is going to be based on and if you have so so imagine this scenario you're looking down at the mandibular ridge in the you know 18 19 20 region and those mm -hmm. teeth have been gone for a long time. That buccal plate is resorbed. We know that that mucogingival junction tends to migrate uh, toward the area over where you would place the implant uh, to get it in the prosthetic location that you would like because you've lost bone. So when the surgeon places the implant, if they get a surgical guide with which just has a hole in it for the ideal prosthetic location for that, and they use a tissue punch and they just go right through that and punch out all that tissue, there's a good chance that the buckle half of their implant or maybe the whole implant is going to be in non-attached tissue. And so what needs to happen is we need to think like doctors instead of just being a, a robot here that's that's just not even thinking and punching tissue, 
And we need to design that incision more toward the lingual so that we are in attached tissue. And then that attached tissue needs to be potentially repositioned apically toward the buccal side, sutured down, so that the implant has attached tissue on both sides. So just imagine that scenario, and I think a lot of people who are punching or doing flapless implant placement, you know, if you hear that term, mm. flapless, same kind of thing for restorative dentists, maybe don't understand what tissue punching is. You know, when you, another term a lot of times you hear is flapless implant placement. I think it's rarely indicated, Wes. Yeah, rarely. You know, we've kind of mo we've moved away from it um, a couple years ago when I before we were we had started RDI. Um, we discussed this amongst the the couple people that I was with, and I really just tried to move people away from punching altogether. Yeah, and we're saying um, this in the healed ridge. Let me specify that. Yes, when you're yes. when you're when you're doing immediate implant placement, sure, we don't need to lay a flap. You're in a socket. But when it's a healed ridge, is what I just want to make sure people don't get confused, thinking, oh, wait, you're saying that anytime you take a tooth out, you could flap? No. You shouldn't be flapping when you're placing immediate implants if you can avoid it at all costs, avoid it. But healed ridge is what we're talking about. And I think that this chapter makes it pretty clear that you need to just be thinking more about where your implant's going. Um, and, and if you see that the tissue is not where it needs to be, figure out a way to get it there. And if you don't know how to get it there, go take some courses or refer to somebody who does and, and be careful because this, I think, is a lot of general dentists, for instance, in the U.S. are getting involved in implant placement. Wes, this is one of the number one problems that I think we're seeing that's leading to problems with implants is people not thinking about where the tissue is and, not, and placing implants into this mucosa or this unattached tissue that really does not protect the implant. And if you're using the wrong kind of implant or, or, or not placing it subcrestal, if it's, a, if it's a rough surface implant, that's a recipe potentially for disaster of being in mucosal tissue and having this rough surface exposed and plaques adhering to mm -hmm. it. And it, it, you, know, you might've got a great prosthetic result, but your biologic result is not gonna be good. I'll tell you what, this is not to digress here and start talking about, um, you know, a lot of different things, but this is where implant dentistry is one of the most complex subjects um, that we that we handle in our office, right? From a standpoint of like there are so many things that can make or break you. And we've said this in the past and we got lucky. I'm just going to say that, right? John and I got lucky. And because we were applying some principles early on in our career and we just lucked out. Yep, on the protocols but, we were using. Yeah, on the <clears throat> protocols we were using. And what I'm going to say is, is that it's not going to be at one year you're going to see the results mm -hmm. of good or bad surgery. Yep. It's not going to be at even two years. But at five to ten years yep. in practice... And you might say, you know what, I'm going to be gone by then or moved out of that town. Right. Well, that's the best way to track your success right, right. is to move away from yep. it. And Then everything's always and, great, yeah. And then everything is great because you're not dealing with the problems. But, you know, whenever I got serious about placing dental implants, I started thinking about how long this patient is going to have this restoration yep. and how long they're going to have this dental implant. And each one of these things starts to add up to more and more success. Right. And we've learned so much from this book, yeah. and I think it's good to kind of sum up this surgical portion of this book with chapter yeah, 10. Yeah, chapter 10 is really... Practical. Yeah, it's really yeah. taking all of that we've talked about up until now and talking about, okay, so yeah, we got all this science, right? And, and of course, we love the science. We know some of you guys listening to this are just like, give me the bottom line. Well, this is the bottom line really mm -hmm. about what does all of this mean? <clears throat> How do you this apply could, This it? could actually, John, this could affect you in a big way yeah. because you could have invested in a particular style of dental implant yep. and you might need to and change. You're going to, you're going to need to change. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that, that, uh, you know, he's saying pretty clearly in this chapter that there's different. And I, now he, one of the things I love about this book is it is implant agnostic. In other words, it, yeah. it does not focus on just one implant. It talks about how you can use multiple designs as long as you use them appropriately. And we've covered that in previous episodes uh, about some of the things you need to watch out for. But he, he makes it pretty clear here at the beginning of chapter 10, 
He says the author's current recommended implant is, right? So everybody's been waiting to hear this if you haven't read the book. Author's current recommended implant is a bone level implant with platform switching and a conical connection. Now, oh man, that is a pretty strong statement because there's a lot of people out there who don't want to actually say uh, this is what you should be using because he's and he's careful. He's careful to say right after that. Of course, this does not mean other types right. of implants should not be used but rather that this implant can be used in the majority of clinical situations. In fact, 90% of the time, if you look at page 128, he describes this particular implant and how it can be used in 90% yeah. of the clinical cases that you're going to see in private practice. Yeah, yeah. Now, you're asking the dental guys to come out and say what we recommend. Right, and we're just going to hold off. Yeah, on that. We're going to talk about end. that. We'll talk about that because there's people been asking us and asking us and asking us. Well, what implant do you use and why and all this? And I think it's important to choose an implant. Like all implants, we know will integrate. That's not the problem, but it's important to choose an implant based upon sound principles of science. And we're going to talk about that at the end. But I think that the first thing to realize is that. You can choose. There's lots of implants that will work, but the advantage of this bone level platform switched conical connection implant is it's the most adaptable to multiple situations. Because why? Well, if you have a polished collar implant, for instance, it's limited in certain ways because of the ability to not place that implant subcrestal, which you might want to do if you have thin tissue. If you have a polished collar implant, you're probably going to be doing more soft tissue augmentation if you want to have bone stay. So he goes right into this. He, he shows a great illustrated summary in figure 10-1 mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. three different clinical situations with a situation of enough vertical soft tissue thickness, less uh, soft tissue thickness, but more than 12 millimeters of bone height before an anatomical structure is reached that you don't want to hit. And the third is there's less than three millimeters tissue and less than 12 millimeters of bone height. And, and folks, if you've listened to this podcast up through these episodes, you kind of know <clears throat> how we're going to handle those three scenarios. If we have more than, greater than, uh, or equal to three millimeters of soft tissue, and we let's just assume we're using a bone level implant that that's, uh, does not have a polished collar, of course, where are we going to place that implant? Well, we can place it at the level of the crest or slightly subcrestal because we know that uh, that we're not going to be limited by our soft tissue thickness. We can put that implant right where it belongs and, and from a result or a standpoint of the bone, and we don't have to drive it any deeper. We don't need mm -hmm. to leave it shallow. We can place it according to the protocol of that manufacturer uh, subcrestally. If we have less than three millimeters of vertical soft tissue, but there's a ton of bone. In other words, you're not- Yeah, just sink it deeper. Yeah, then drive it deeper in order to but, account for that. But John, you cannot do that with a polished collar and you cannot do that without certain types of good conical good connection. connections. That's where you It has to be a great connection. Right, so that's where your implant system starts to matter, Wes, right? I mean, if you have tons of tissue, mm -hmm. then it really isn't going to matter what you use. As long as your tissue and bone is adequate, you can pretty much use whatever you want. When you start getting into more limited soft tissue thicknesses and you need to place the implant deeper, assuming you don't want to augment the soft tissue, Okay, mm -hmm. now you need to have an implant that you can place subcrestally with stability of the connection and also with platform shifting. Why? Not just because it maintains bone, which is great, but also you need to be able to get your parts on and off easily with, with, uh, when you're taking impressions, when you're placing restorations without impinging on the bone because you're going to mm -hmm. be subcrestal, and if you have, you better you better know how to bone profile. John. Yeah, that's, what that's you're right. Saying. You got to either know, definitely yeah. got to know how to profile bone and have parts that are smaller than the implant width, so that you can just get them on and off. 
The, th- That's right. the third scenario, though. Yeah, let me, let me just take this one yeah, here for yeah, just yeah. a second, John. I'm, I'm going to interrupt you just for yeah. a second because I don't think you would really understand why he said 12 millimeters mm. was your limit unless you've done surgery for a while. Mm, mm-hmm. Because when you start dealing with ridges that you have less than 12 millimeters of bone available, that there's some sort of anatomy there, whether it's the sinus, the inferior alveolar nerve, or just in the lower anterior, I mean, it could be the base of the mandible, yep. you know, if you're doing an all on four. So what you're saying here is that there is a massive amount of, of tissue lost, soft tissue and bone. Now, this is interesting because I'm a believer in short implants and the particular implant system that I'm using has a short implant with a deep internal conical connection that's platform switched, mm-hmm. but I, and I can offset that subcrestively. But the problem that I find in those situations where I'm using shorter implants, the tissue is so deficient, the soft tissue, both vertically and horizontally, that you're going to need some type of augmentation. And this is why John and I think in some of your patients, you need to have the wheelhouse of being able to augment the soft tissue, which is why we put ourselves in front of Pat Allen, the master of this. So I think that's why he has this third scenario, less than 12 millimeters of bone. You need to possibly consider augmenting the soft tissue in some way. Right. And if you, and if you are comfortable with shorter implants, you might be able to push that scenario, right? So if you've got, say, I don't know, eight millimeters of bone and you Mm -hmm. have thin soft tissue, maybe Mm -hmm. if you have a good solid connection implant with platform shifting and you're comfortable, Mm -hmm. say you got a six millimeter long implant, well, maybe you can still drive that six millimeter implant a little bit subcrestal and you can be okay without augmentation, assuming you've measured and you know where you're at. But, you know, that is of definitely increasing the complexity. And, and what I appreciate about Lincoln Vicious here is he's trying to stick with the most time-tested approach here, which is, you know, using more of a conventional mm. length implant, thinking about, you know, taking everything to the, right. the safest point it can be. And right. as some... Four by 11s, right? Right, I right. Mean, that's the most used implant of all time, right. the four by 11. So fixture. he's looking at, you know, what can we do to be the most predictable and, you know, certainly short implants, a lot of people look at short implants and go, oh, yeah, we got short implants. Well, they're very complex and, and they're not easy yeah. to place and they're, and they're not, uh, they're, I mean, they work amazing. But they're, and you better not get bone loss on those. Right, but exactly. But you don't <laughs> right? have a lot of, of leeway here. If, you may, if something goes wrong, then, you, you know, yeah, you lose two millimeters on a six millimeter implant. You just don't have a lot more to give. So I think that this is, uh, you know, brings it all home for us that we need to be thinking about this. And then he goes into different scenarios of kind of how, okay, so if you mm-hmm. need to augment, uh, when do you do that? How do you do that? He talks about how you can do that at the time of implant placement in a single stage. Yeah, he or, shows a short implant yep, here yep. being placed and and how that they <clears throat> augmented it with a, um, I think it looks like a xenograft of some type. Yeah, he's a fan of uh, porcine-derived de- xenograft, which is yep. interesting, you know, so there's di- two different approaches. You got your... Um, muco graft, which is, I think, the most common uh, mm-hmm. porcine derived collagen matrix, um, and then you got your alloderm, uh, which which he used um, early, especially earliest studies that he did. And I think he's it looks like he's moving more. And we we need to have him on the show, of course. We need to talk about what are you using because everybody right. wants to know that. But it looks like, according to the book, that he's using. Um, more of the uh, mucograft material, which... Yeah, I think he's using more xenograft materials, which we know that Pat Allen talked about, yep. uh, that he'll be moving to a xenograft material um, coming to, into the United States uh, in the next 18 months. Yeah, um, yeah, and I think that, that mucograft is, is you know, he, he's liking that more. Again, I'd love to talk to Lincoln Vicious himself and kind of ask him, you know, mm-hmm. what, are you, what are you liking more about that? Is it the handling characteristics? Is it the histology that you're seeing? Uh, you know, in, in other studies, uh, what is it that you're liking more about this versus alloderm? But I think either one can be successful here. And I think he would agree with that as long as you are mm-hmm. augmenting. And he shows some techniques about how to do that at time of implant placement. If you are doing a single stage or a two stage surgery, um, you can you can be successful either way. But you have to be able to understand the surgery there. You got to be able to advance the tissue properly, get primary closure. Not always an easy thing. As we've seen after taking Pat Allen's course, 
uh, you know, sometimes it's a lot of advancement of tissue, sometimes a lot of mm -hmm. mobilization of tissue. Um, you have to be aware of where you're at. Uh, definitely not a, an easy, and, and definitely a time-consuming procedure. And, you know, here's an interesting thing, you know, I want to I maybe focus on this for just a second. How, Wes, how many, how many specialists do you think know how to augment soft tissue? I mean, I'm talking about not, I'm talking about around implants, okay? Periodontists, let's give them a lot of credit <clears throat> around teeth. They are masters of soft tissue augmentation. I think most of them are. But why is it? I mean, I don't see this being done very often. Why do you think that is? You know, what, what's going on out there? Is it a lack of understanding, you think, or, or is it really more of what I think, the elephant in the room, which is how do you charge for it? <clears throat> and it takes time. Yeah. Let's just talk about that for a minute. It's time consuming. Yeah. And you can't charge enough for it. Yeah. Or if you do, all of a sudden people start saying, oh, well, why is that surgeon's implant always however yep. much more? Because let me just say this is that this stuff, whether you're using, um, you know, mucoderm or uh, I mean, alloderm yeah. or yeah. whether you're using xenografts or allografts. Yeah. Right. Unless you're doing autographs, right, 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 you're gonna have some type of overhead. Now, if you use an autograft, you say, "Well, I can use autograft every time." Well, your patients hate that for one, right. so the patient comfort factor, and you're not gonna have very many patients accept that. And their word gets around that you're hurting the palate, right? You're if not you're cutting the palate every single time, I mean, that's fine, right? But you but know, that's fine, but, and that works. But there's a downside right? to that, of course, too. There's a downside, yeah. and you don't have overhead of that, but you have the time factor. Yep. And we know that for single teeth, you need to be booking about an hour and a half for this procedure. Yep. And that's from the master. Now, there's some of you that probably could do it faster. Sure. Some of you probably do it slower. But the average time is about the time that it takes you to prep a crown and seat a crown. Yep. Okay? So that's an hour and a half. Now, let, I mean... I mean, I'll just tell I you, just don't think, my oral surgeons that I oh, refer to... Oh, I know to, what he says. He told me. He told me. He's like, I don't have time. Yep. This his, this is the problem. This is a major issue. This is a major so, issue. What are we going to be dealing with, John, here in 10, 15 years? At the end, the tail end of our the beginning of the end of our career, the last 10 years of our career. Yeah. Right? You know what we're going to deal with? Is all the slop mm -hmm. that either we created, yeah. right? Because we didn't know what we were doing, or other people have created. Mm -hmm. And so I'm I'm a little concerned about it because we didn't know, okay? We didn't really know. Right, right. At the beginning, right? it was a lack of understanding right. that creates the problem. Now, I would say that now there's enough evidence, and you, you hear us talk about evidence and research. <clears throat> Hands down, we're going to, let's just sum this surgical portion up right here, okay? The first 10 chapters, hands down, if you do not have adequate soft tissue, you better be grafting. Right. Right? right, or you better changing be altering your, protocol. your surgical technique yeah, yeah. and changing your protocol. Right, because if you don't, you're in trouble. Yep, and it's not one year, it's not two year, John. To me, it's the five and ten year results. Yes, and that's where it becomes a real problem. And you try to fix it at five and ten years, because Pat Allen showed us it is a lot more difficult, and the results are unpredictable. And and also, I think that takeaway from this is, if you've been placing implants, you know, if if you're just getting started. Man, it's awesome because oh, you can immediately right? incorporate this into your process from the beginning and you can you can basically take this and, and immediately implement this and start this way. So good. But the hardest thing is if you've been placing implants for a while, you are going to need to be if you if you haven't been thinking about this, it's a major re-education. You have to think about your incision design totally differently. Mm -hmm. You have to think about your implant placement depth totally differently. You have to think about your implant design totally differently. What am I going to actually put on the shelf? You got to ignore basically everything that every company will tell you about whether their implant is better than the other because of some bone loss study they'll show. Because it's almost all BS, man. Because yeah. they weren't paying attention to soft tissue thickness. They're cherry picking a study without that never looked at soft tissue thickness, never looked at incision design, never looked at really attached tissue. Most of these, they just simply looked at radiographs on years on year one and at time of placement, and they said, "Look, the bone looks great." So we have to really I, I think. Let me, let me just this. say this: is that this. you're gonna you're gonna frustrate a lot of people 
with this knowledge. Mm-hmm. And you're going to have to walk away from conversations because you will get criticized. And and I would just walk away because it, it's either a lack of you know understanding <clears throat> of the concepts. Yep. Um, it's a lack of understanding of the current and most up-to-date literature and literature that has been repeated and um, proven in time and, and very excellent, excellent research has been done to show that these concepts work. I'm just going to, and I'm just going to say this to us and we don't, we, you guys, I think, no, you've listened to the show long enough. We don't plug our stuff very often that we're doing, No, we don't. but this is what we're teaching people when they come to our courses on implant placement and restoration. Mm -hmm. We are actually teaching them when they learn how to place their very first implant. Yep. We're saying, okay, where is the bone? Where is the soft tissue? (laughs) If you only have one millimeter, what are you going to do? You're going to have to either use a shorter implant and drive it deeper, or you're going to have to augment the tissue. Which is your decision? And what type of implant should you use here? Can you use a polished collar here? What's the advantage or downside of that? So if you're going to, if you've gone to an implant placement course, you've gone to an implant placement course and you've just been slamming implants, you flap, you know, flapless placement, tissue punching, using whatever implant system they have. If they haven't even told you why you're using that system, if they're not teaching you about depth and soft tissue, whatever, that's basically, I'm not going to say it's 20 years old, but it's probably more than it's, it's five to 10 years out of date at this point. Yeah. It's 10 years out of date, yeah, man. Yeah. So cause it's 10 years out of date. Link of Vicious is publishing this starting off 10 years ago. And now we know that it's an issue. So man. we, 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 need yeah, we to don't be, plug our stuff very often. Yeah. I mean, but, we're trying to modernize. But John, this. when I wrote, when I wrote the implant engineering section, yeah, <laughs> the online module for RDI, it's, it, it, it goes into why we choose the type of implant we choose for teaching yep. first-time placers because it has flexibility mm-hmm. to tackle 90% of the cases. So listen, if you want to come and you want to learn from us, there are other people to learn from, you're going to hear these concepts being taught. Yep. In fact, um, if you sign up for our course <laughs> <laughs> right. this year, guess what? You get. Just this year in 2020, I hate it for those in 2019 know, and the years past, but this year we are giving – all participants of restorative driven implants think uh, a copy of zero bone loss concepts. Yeah, because it's what our basically our curriculum's ba- it's based on. Yeah, and we're not getting those yeah, so, for free or anything. They're, we're, no, no, we're no, paying we're not getting those for them. Free. You know, it's not. It's yeah. not. We have no. You know, that's not agreement. We appreciate quintessence but, and. Um, but quintessence and is, the, is you know good good on them to get together with Linkovicious and publish this. And it, and it was so funny when we had been. We developed, you know, developed this whole curriculum to teach, and this book wasn't even out yet, but we were aware of his studies. And you called me. And I called you, and I got the book, and I was like, Wes, you're not going to believe it. This book pretty much is our curriculum, like the way we're teaching people to place implants, and it's all because we've been trying to keep up no, with the what, literature again, for the we, last 10 years. We got a little lucky. Yeah, right? to start. Right. Yep. We also, we also being read and well-researched pays off, John. It does, and it does. It pays off in a big way. Also, it pays to be very humble, okay? It pays to be very, like, mm. critical of yourself. Yeah, being, being willing to accept the change. Being willing to be wrong <clears throat> and accept yep. change. Yep. And so, listen. Hey, listen, John. This has been another great episode yep. where, where we've, we've kind of concluded out Chapter 10. I'm excited about the prosthetic oh, concepts. Yeah. There'll be a lot of feathers that will be ruffled here, <laughs> okay? And a lot of things that, John, you and I are going to have fun talking about. Oh, yeah. And so, listen, if, if you're listening to this and you know someone, right, that hasn't heard uh, The Dental Guys, hey, listen, send, send them a link to our, our podcast. Uh, thedentalguys.net is the website. You can find us on Spotify or iTunes. That's Apple Podcasts now. Um, also, on your favorite podcatcher, uh, John and I use Podcast Attic a lot. We've used that for years. Mm-hmm. And so we really appreciate those that are following us on Facebook. Check us out there. Also, did you know we have a YouTube channel that's growing? Yeah. It seems like we're getting more and more subscribers to that. I think we're over a, over 1,000 subscribers yep. now to our YouTube channel. And leave us a channel. review, please, on Apple Podcasts. That is how people find us that are yep. just not directly word of mouth. That's, that's hugely beneficial. Leave your review. Tell Apple Podcasts what you think about us because that is a direct link to getting people to listen to us. We really appreciate everybody that leaves those yeah, reviews. Yeah, some of you have expressed interest about me 
meeting us, we will be available at the Academy of Osseo Integration. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't have a planned meetup yet. Um, and John, I want to kind of talk to you about what that could look yeah. like if we could have time. I don't know if we'll have time for a meetup for maybe coffee in Seattle, which would be epic, <laughs> would a third epic. wave coffee. That's right. Like meetup, dental out. guys, listeners. That'd be awesome, right? Yeah. And so, hey, listen, we really appreciate you listening to our show. Um, again, um, it's uh, really a privilege to be able to review a book uh, like this. It's high quality. Check it out. If you need to know where to go purchase it, uh, you can go right to Quintessence and buy it from them directly, or you can check it on, on Amazon and have it shipped to your house in two days. And so... <laughs> Uh, we appreciate those that have been sending us pictures that they got their book in over Christmas and it was a Christmas gift or something like that. So that's really cool. So for John, I'm Wes, and we are the Dental Guys. <laughs> <laughs>